There are 239 experts that basically think that coronavirus is airborne. The WHO says there's not enough conclusive evidence. Who's right? Um, I think they're they're both right. I think the problem is is that there's a difference between no evidence and evidence that there's not airborne transmission. And what we are seeing is that we don't have enough evidence to conclusively say air, airborne transmission is a major driver. We know that aerosols um, have some element of driving cases, especially in the healthcare setting. And what that letter I think was trying to say is that these aerosols may be a bigger driver than what we originally understood. And so the while we are not seeing widespread air, airborne transmission like in some other viruses, um, there is a possibility that aerosol is driving more cases than we currently understand. But, um, Lauren, if the virus lingers in the air indoors, it changes everything from school reopenings to bars and restaurants indoors reopening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the the place where we worry the most about these aerosols is in an, is a crowded indoor setting with bad ventilation. Um, it's why people are are saying that they prefer you to be outside if you're going to congregate. Um, that you want more outdoor space, you want better ventilation, you want better airflow, you want to be further apart, um, and and the movement of the mm -hmm. air really helps with getting those aerosols out. You know, Lauren, not that I would ever think you would darken the door of Mary Jane's at Boston University. I'm sure you didn't do that your freshman uh, year up at BU, but the kids have to go back to school. Give us some wisdom here of the intractable nature of this from kindergarten up to freshman year at Boston University. How do we get the kids back to school? Yeah. So just yesterday, I think Secretary Azar said that as we, since we don't see as many cases of spread in healthcare settings, we can apply those practices to school and get kids back. And I think it's just not that easy. Um, <clears throat> I think we need a, a much more local approach to how we reopen schools. What do the cases look like? What does the spread look like in a, in a local community? And do we continue to apply these out of school measures to con to continue to educate people um, do we keep doing online or in places where where there is not much spread and we have cases controlled and we can use things like contact tracing can we put kids um, and adults back in the classroom so I think it, it requires a really local approach yeah but Lauren this takes resources and we, you know this is an ancient United States thing for our global audience the issue of states rights versus federal rights on education is a third rail across the United States history, well over 200 years. How does Johns Hopkins uh, believe that we should fund the needed funds now that will be utilized in all of eight weeks? Education funds have to be an absolute priority. And I, I think um, penalizing places because they reopen schools in a different way or because they can't physically reopen the doors to their schools is, is a it, it, it's a crime, and and it ha we have to prioritize, especially the children yeah. who, who really they have to be back in the classroom, and we have to look for ways in which we can do that safely. So everyone wants kids to be back, everybody wants kids to right. be in an educational setting, but it has to be done safely. It cannot be done unsafely, or we'll be right back where we started. What should older teachers do? We've had a number of tragedies in New York where we've lost faculty members at schools public and private schools as well. They're of a certain vintage. They're a high, do they just not show up to teach this year? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that older teachers, teachers at higher risk, teacher with teachers with multiple comorbidities or other vulnerable teachers have to have an assessment done with their physician, with their personal physician. Um, they have to take into account account their personal risk and their familial risk. And then they have to make a decision about what's safe for them. And again, they should not be penalized because they cannot safely reenter a setting where we don't really understand what the risks are yet. So because we don't fully understand the picture of COVID in kids, we can't say to a teacher who's older or higher risk, you're safe, you're fine, go back to school. We have to find other ways that, that those people can support the educational system, even if it means making curriculum online, um, making resources for other teachers who can be back in the classroom. There are ways to continue to engage teachers who cannot safely be back in the classroom.
Uh, Lauren, when will we understand better, you know, how this is transmitted through, <clears throat> through children? In the UK, many schools, if not almost all schools, reopened for certain classes, and there was a belief that actually it's just much more difficult for a, a child, a smaller child, to transmit it to another small child. I mean, when are we sure that that's the case, if it is? I think we'll see that this year as schools do reopen. Um, we have to be very careful to um, to understand what's happening in kids. So that means testing kids even when they're asymptomatic. It means um, taking kids to doctor's appointments. It means paying careful attention to mild symptoms in kids and getting kids their flu shots in particular and other vaccines on schedule in particular so that we understand this is COVID versus something else um, and getting kids tested when they show even the mildest cases of symptoms. That's how we'll really understand what's happening and what those transmission dynamics look like. Have we become better at actually treating COVID-19 either at home or in hospitals? So the number of infections are rising, but the number of deaths aren't necessarily rising by as much. So is it just lagging or are we better at it? I think we're, we hope that we're getting better at it. And I think a lot of the evidence suggests that we are getting better at it. We're getting better at understanding the disease process and how it affects people and how we can move them out of the hospital setting quicker. I, I do also think that deaths are lagging. We know that to be the case. We know that deaths do lag behind cases, and that makes sense um, in general. Uh, and, and so places where we're seeing a huge increase, a rapid increase in cases, but not deaths, does not necessarily mean that the deaths will not come, unfortunately.